Good evening and welcome to a very special edition of the Soccer Podcast. I'm joined by Joe. How are we, Joe? How are we, Trent? I'm not too bad yourself. Not bad, not bad. I have a little sore joined... throat. That's it, the only thing, but yeah. It's not about you me You might have got it from me. Uh, you might have got from the cold I had a few weeks ago, Joe. So I hope yeah. you're feeling better. Um, but we are joined by Pohang Steelers center back, former Perth Glory player, and he's a host, or he's a co-host of the uh, Shooting Stars podcast. Alex Grant, welcome to the show. Hey boys, glad to be here. Long overdue, I'll just add. <laughs> <laughs> I said to you earlier off air that I've watched, uh, listened to a few of the pods and uh, been itching to get on, so it's uh, it's great to be here. Thanks. For sure, for sure. Now, uh, Joe, Alex's brother's a, f- a fan of the show. He's been talking to you a little bit uh, over the over the year we've been doing the pod. Um, Joe, you wanted to go to one of the UWA games because he's a coach there, isn't he? I've actually been to a few of those games when they were versing Alexander Florina. And yeah, um, Alex's brother Angus. So, um, he, he knows his tactics. I'll, I'll, I'll say that much. But yeah, he was missing Alex as, as one of the centre backs. I'd say. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> He'd love to get you down. Now, Alex, you're in South Korea at the moment, um, and you're playing for Pyongyang Steelers. Now, you're injured at the moment. Is that what's the injury situation? Um, yeah, you, you're on the right know. lines. Yeah, um, I am in Korea. I'm Pyongyang Steelers defender at the moment, but yeah, not played too many games over. The last few months, um, in my debut, I uh, picked up a, an injury to my foot, um, which was untimely. Uh, and unfortunately, that's kept me out for yeah the last 12 weeks or so. So I'm uh, back in training now. Um, and the boys, we're going to Thailand in next week, it is. So, uh, yeah, we're off there to the Champions League. And hopefully I can get some action over there and, and start playing again and then, and then roll on with the season when I come back. So hopefully pick up a few games over there, like I said. You can see the lady, the lady boys. Yeah, yeah. All right, okay. So it's, it's one of those kind of podcasts, is it? <laughs> I wasn't sure whether I should say that, but yeah. yeah well, anyway. there you go. You, you, you're throwing it out there. I, yeah, I've got my missus in the other room, so I better be quiet. But, um, it's a, it's a, a feature of Thailand, uh, Joe. Uh, you, you, yeah. You, welcome to bring it up. It is, yeah. There's a there's a famous video on Twitter. I don't know if you've seen it. It's uh, it's pretty grotesque, but yeah, what the guy in the video does say. Um, Going to uh, Thailand and not doing the business with the lady boys, like uh, going to Turkey and not having a kebab. But you, uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's just one of those things, isn't it? It's a uh, yeah, notorious. But no, cool. we'll I stay think, away from that. I think we're locked yeah, in the bubble anyway, we so um, we'll uh, we won't be we won't be venturing out. So I'll have to stay put in the room and uh, yeah, just uh, probably play PlayStation or something like that. I think on that note, Trent, we might need to hit the intro music. We'll hit the intro, Joe imagination and fantasy yeah. there's so much imagination there's so much fantasy and flair imagination and flair lack a bit of imagination fantasy imagination and fantasy yeah. there's so much imagination there's so much fantasy and flair imagination and flair lack a bit of imagination and fantasy yeah. lots of imagination and fantasy there Alex you're a centre back what's the most imagination and fantasy you've done on the football field Jeez, you've watched me play. I haven't got much. Um, <laughs> um, oh, you're from from a curveball there. That's under the know. bus, Joe. I think under Popper, you probably weren't allowed to venture forward too much. Um, yeah, I think that under Popper, I mean, yeah, we uh, were in a sense a bit robotic, but um, it brought the best out of me, I guess, and um, success amongst the group as well. And the way we lined up under him was probably um, the best I'd experienced, the best coaching I'd received probably in my career. Um, and I learned a lot under Popper and, and Hayden Fox, and they taught me a lot about defending. I think it's definitely an art. Um, and when, you, when you're aware of, of certain things and certain details that probably I hadn't recognised in the past, it's de- it definitely brought on my game. And, yeah, it was uh, it was one of the best experiences of my career, like I said, to play to play under Popper. For sure. And uh, one of our viewers, uh, Milan Kasari, asked a question. He says, Alex, what was it about Popper's team in that year? We won the league and reached the grand final that made it so successful. What was? What do you think one of the, some of the key things were under Popper? Um, I think the mentality more than anything. Um, I think in the past, and you know, no disrespect to, to Kenny, who was my previous manager, he had a, a great philosophy as well. And, a great style of football but I, I think the one thing that crept in 
um, in previous years was the travel and, um, you know, certain excuses, I think, that probably mentally had an effect on the playing group. And we kind of lent on that slightly when things weren't going our way. Um, and I think when Popper came in, that all got brushed to one side. And I think that season we went unbeaten away from home. Um, and, it, and the proof was in the pudding, you know, that the boys were switched on. and We didn't use anything as an excuse to succeed. And I know in pre-season, probably a couple of weeks before the, the season began, we um, we got whisked away um, to Adelaide to play a game there. Um, and we flew the day of the game. Um, and then we, we travelled back, we played, and then we, we travelled back um, the, the morning after. And leading up to that game, we'd had probably three days on the bounce of double sessions on the pitch morning and afternoon. So it was pretty intense, but, you know, it kind of just built that, um, you know, mental toughness within the group and it definitely helped. And like I said, we didn't use it as a as an excuse over the course of the season. Like even just on that season, like every season before that, like I was turned 18 maybe in 2016, I'd always see Perth Grey players at nightclubs. That season under Popper, I didn't see anyone in like in Northbridge or like the city at night. Yeah, I think he, he brought um, a bit of a fear factor uh, and a reputation in with him. And boys, obviously within the A-League, players, you know, move around a lot. So it was, um, we'd had word that he was pretty tough and skin folds had to be under a certain certain number and the same with your weight and that continued the whole time he was there um so we weren't we we knew what we were expecting when he came in so I think boys kind of just uh got into line early doors and sorted themselves out because I I remember having a conversation with someone I can't remember now but I think he uh he had plans of getting rid of a lot of us when he first got in and he wanted to bring in a lot of players and I think he realized that you know we weren't half bad you know and um, <laughs> we, we could actually we could actually kick a ball around and he uh, he then just added a few things and a few minor touches and it uh you know it obviously worked just touching on skin folds um I have some fun facts about south korea um factor 21 on this list is uh, south korea has the second lowest percentage of obese citizens following japan you know what it's funny you say that joel because today i was just You're driving I was just driving home and there was a, I'll say a larger woman um, walking down the side of the road. And it was just surreal because I'd not seen many larger Koreans since I've been here. So you, you're right. Great start. Second um, in the world. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I don't know what it is because the, the diet, if you go to the shops, it's full of rubbish. They love sweet stuff. There's loads of cafes. Uh, they don't do food in the cafes, which has been um, a bit disappointing because that's something we're used to in Perth and a luxury we have. But they, um, yeah, they love the cakes and the croissants. And, you know, there's a bakery on every corner, so it's surprising there aren't more. But there you go. Yeah, they must it's be interesting. Um, because fact eleven on this list is more than ninety percent of the world's seaweed consumption comes from South Korea. Seaweed, very good for you, Joe. There's plenty of that. Fact. <laughs> yeah, I've, seen, I've seen lots of that. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Um, now, Alex, the skin folds of the glory, how were they? Do you reckon you were the, in the best shape you were in your career when you were there? Without a doubt. Um, oh, yeah. Well, I definitely saw it. So when the World Cup was on in 2018, I was going to the Crown every every few nights or whatever it was to either watch the Socceroos or England play. And my brother, who you've mentioned already, went along with me and he was down in beers and asking me if I wanted some. And I already knew at this point that Popper was coming in and it was very hard for me to, to turn them away. Um, especially in that moment when England obviously reached the semi final and when they scored, a lot of beer was getting thrown up in the air and it was like, I was <laughs> <laughs> sticking my tongue out trying to, uh, trying to get some, but <laughs> You know, it's uh, it was one of those things, yeah. Um, my skin folds were, were pretty good, I'll, I'll say, whilst, whilst Papa was there. And I think, like, going back to what I said earlier, um, it's definitely instilled in me now, I feel, um, with defending and 
things like the details, like I said, um, one being skin folds is definitely something that, um, you know, I kind of keep on top of now to make sure that I'm, I'm ready to perform. For sure, for sure. Now, one of our, touching on um, being in South Korea, one of our listeners writes in, uh, Billy Aid, and he says, how did you handle the big, uh, the differences in cultural lifestyle changing, moving overseas, and what were the biggest shocks, unexpected things when you moved to Korea? Yeah, it's um, it has been a massive change. It's completely different to Australia um, and the UK um, from a football aspect and, you know, just culturally and and uh, living day to day. And I came over uh, in January on my own and then my uh, partner and, and my son followed later on in uh, March, I believe. So I was on my own for a while and um, trying to adjust and trying to get things sorted for when they came and, you know, made a few trips to Ikea to pick up some furniture and whatnot to fill the apartment. But uh, the language has definitely been the toughest um, aspect of the move. Uh, I should probably learn a bit, but I've only got a few <laughs> few words. Um, so I've been a bit ignorant in that respect. But uh, yeah, the language is crazy. So a lot of people here, especially in Pohang, because we kind of, they call it the country here. Um, because it's not a massive city, it's not highly populated, and there aren't many foreigners that travel to Pohang. Um, so not many people speak English. So that's probably been a bit of a challenge. But every now and then someone will surprise you. There was a bloke down the road in like the 7-Eleven who just started having a conversation with me in English the other day. And I was like, geez, that's a that's a surprise. And, um, you know, that's it. And, and from a football aspect, um, I think culture, again, it's, it's definitely different. The, I'm used to having a, a chatty dressing room full of banter, um, decent music, I'll say, because I'm not a massive fan of the K-pop. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you, you've got to adjust and, and uh, you know, I don't mind. Is it BTS, is it? They're the, yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're the big one. Yeah, they're, they've got a couple of decent tracks, but besides that, I've not listened to much. So maybe I'll have to go in a little deeper. Um, but, yeah, I mean, on the, on the pitch... The boys have been good to me. To be fair, the the group have, have welcomed me in well, and I think it was it was good for me to come earlier uh, than the other foreigners. I, I arrived probably a month or so earlier, so I kind of got to know the land a little better and everyone within the club, and I felt that helped me personally um, to adjust just better. Just on BTS, I'm currently at, at McDonald's. We're not sponsored by them, but there is a BTS meal, and I tried it on Sunday night. How and there's like it? a different sauce they use. It's like mayonnaise, but it's like kind of spicy. Mm. It's just, yeah, mm. interesting. Yeah, I just Is it, kim- it. Uh, I'm thinking of the word. It's a type of mayonnaise. Um, I'm not too sure. But yeah, it was amazing. Um, Trent, I'm sure you have some more football-related re- topics. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but I'm trying to... <laughs> Alex, about learning the language, like, I know, because I, I learned Italian in high school. Um, and obviously, I did it in school, and it was difficult. But you you, you learn it every you, you know, learning it every day. But like, obviously, speaking to people firsthand, you're going to pick up some things. But if you're not practicing it, you're not learning it. Like, how is it? How are you going about learning it? Are you getting Duolingo up on your phone, or um, um, to, to sort of yeah understand yeah, there's more? Yeah, a great great app called Papago. I don't know whether you've heard of it, but that's come in handy since we've been here and typing in. And when I'm at the store, and you know, the clerks there and she's telling me something in Korean. I have no idea what she's saying. And that's been the funny thing as well. People just expect you to know the language. So they'll be saying and rambling on in Korean and I'm not looking at them like, you know, they've got two heads because I have no idea what they're saying. I just, generally I just nod and say yes. And Can you give us a little taste of your Korean? There you go. Genchana is, is, are you okay? But it can be used in several ways. So yeah, it's a bit like French, you know, like Sava and oh, yeah, Sava, you know, like yeah. yeah, whatever. I don't know. Croissant and uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Uh, Anya is hello, and then goodbye. I have, I don't know. I just ramble Anya out again, and <laughs> I don't know. Same, same. Um, da is thank you. Uh, that's generally all I need to know. Oh, bande, that's change. So when we're training, and bande, bande, change the ball, and that generally the ball gets kicked to the other side. So I must be saying something right. <laughs> uh, but besides that, that's that's my limit. I reckon I haven't got much else for you. 
That's all right. That's pretty good. Um, now, Ange Postacoglu facts one of our listeners writes in. He says, "What's some of your favourite hangouts in uh, in Korea? Have you found a hangouts. good spot, a good cafe? I've got a cracking Mexican on the beachfront. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean the, the Korean food. We've we've actually made some friends whilst we've been here. Me and my partner." Uh, through Brandon O'Neill. So when Brandon was here, uh, he got friendly with a couple of um, people, uh, a girl called Kate and her hus- uh, boyfriend, sorry, G1, who's Korean. Kate's from uh, Newcastle, I believe, up in the northeast of England. So uh, that's been handy for uh, Lauren to get Pally with her. And they've kind of introduced us to a couple of restaurants, the uh, Shabba Shabba, uh, cracking restaurant where it's like just, one big hot pot and you chuck all your veg and your your meat into this broth and it's kind of like um help yourself you know you go around on the buffet and just chuck everything in there and then at the end uh, when you've eaten all the veg and meat you were chucking some rice and then you make like a porridge um it's got seaweed in it um i'll just add and uh, that's been really yummy and we went to another restaurant they took us to another korean restaurant the other day which was really nice but I have no idea what kind of what it's called. Um, yeah. <laughs> but besides that, there's a, like a few cafes around there where we are, and like I said, Pohang is kind of off the grid a little with regards to all the other cities here in uh, in Korea. And you know, it's looking at other players who I know over here, um, living it up in Seoul, and with all the other foreigners up there because there's <laughs> plenty of foreigners up in Seoul, and they come into cafes and they're having smashed Davo every day and. And all this and that, and I'm I'm eating seaweed. <laughs> <laughs> Just touching on the restaurants there. Um, fact number ten uh, for South Korea uh, in Korea, scissors, scissors are used to cut meat, noodles, vegetables, and kimchi. It's number ten. Scissors oh, are used, yeah. yeah, to cut meat. Korean barbecue. I forgot to. I've left that out as well. That's oh, of course. <laughs> very popular over here. Um, yeah, we've been there a few times, but you can only go so many times before you get a little bored of it. So I'll have to. Spread them out over the time I'm here. Sure. Me- remember my first time at Korean barbecue. I had it was like a large like prize for like dinner. I was drinking heaps, and it got like that stage at the night where I'm, like we just go out dinner. Like fuck it, we'll get Korean barbecue. But I thought all the meats were just like cold meats, like all your Italian meats. So I was just like eating all this raw meat at the at the start. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, not, so, I'm yeah. not surprised, Joe. I'm not surprised. Yeah, oh, I was a it was a large night to say the you least. Refused, yeah, the, there I, you refused. There you go. I'll oh yeah, you know. but then, yeah. Then like one of the guys like told me, I was like, "What are you doing? You're wasting like all this fucking meat." I'm going, <laughs> "Yeah, true." Um, but yeah, no, it was awesome. Yeah, love it. <laughs> sure. Now, Alex, I want to go slightly back in time um, because, well, when you were in Portsmouth and, and Stoke, I read an article I remember a long time ago when you signed for the Glory. And because I think you, I think you come from Stoke, or you're just from at the time. And I think it was along the lines of you were very, very close to breaking the first team or breaking the EPL team. A new manager came in, and then it sort of all fell apart. Was that? Uh, that was the sort of the story of that article. Was that sort of how it went when you were at Stoke? Uh, how close were you to sort of train with the first team and, and whatnot? Um, oh, I don't know who wrote that article, but they were. <laughs> 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 They, were, they, they obviously didn't give me a call before they wrote it, did they? So um, these journals, eh, they were, uh, never get They're the on facts their own, right. They? they are, they are, they are. <laughs> um, God help them, eh? But uh, no, I, I think uh, when I was at Stoke, uh, especially, I think I went there, I left Portsmouth when I was, I think, 18, 19. Um, and I was actually going on holiday to Egypt with uh, my girlfriend at the time. Uh, we're going away for a week and then I had plans to return to Australia for the off season. And uh, looking back, um, I, I probably rushed my decision a little into going to Stoke. I feel at the time, probably with me being a bit young and naive and, and whatnot, I didn't really assess all my options um, as probably what I should have and been a bit a little bit more patient at the time and I just wanted to get to Sharm El Sheikh and live it up in the sun and have a week in Egypt and then get home and, you know, get on the beers with my mates back in Perth. But um, we we knew some of my agent. Um, I had an old coach who'd 
been at Portsmouth and he was now the director of like the academy and he was the one who messaged my agent um, and asked because he'd heard that I was leaving Portsmouth and he asked me if I wanted to go up to Stoke and I went up just before the holiday for two days and within those two days they kind of said yeah we'll we'll have you uh, we'll offer you a contract so I signed the deal there and then so it was kind of a relief because I, I always had that when I was going back home to Oz I always, I always had that security of going back the following season to a club with a contract so that was my fear because I'd never experienced that before um, so like I said, I feel like I maybe rushed into that decision slightly. And, and when I got to Stoke, obviously the facilities were great. The players were, you know, top top players playing in the Premier League in that environment. But I soon learned that I probably was no way near making it into the first team and playing at a Premier League level. Don't get me wrong, like, I mean, I was doing well, but I was probably never close to breaking into that first team with what they had on offer um, and the resources they had because at the end of the day when you at a Premier League club they can pluck players from from out their arse you know wherever they want so it was definitely an eye-opener in some respects and a wake-up call I think as well and I, I don't regret anything in my career but like I said going back to that moment if I could tell my younger self I'd probably say that just wait it out and, and see what your options are and maybe go to a lower league or and probably this is some advice for any younger players nowadays who you know want to go to the top straight away it's not always the best the best route to go down I mean if you're good enough fair play but sometimes it's it's better to start from the bottom and then that's probably what led me going to glory as well I, I, I saw that more of a side step rather than a backward step so yeah and like just on that, like, that's been the story for so many like young Australians going to Europe as well. They'll sign for like a big club and then it's just like mediocrity for them for like the next five years. And like they take a step backwards and then they'll take two steps forward again. And then like they've kind of restarted their career with the kind of thing. Yeah, without a doubt. And I think one thing, whilst I was there, I went out on loan to Macclesfield and they were playing in the conference. And at the time I was um and ah and whether to initially go there because it was the coach of the the reserve team who asked me if I wanted to go there and I felt personally I could have maybe gone to a, a better club like a league one or a league two club but I know at the time we were getting close to the the deadline and they said like this is all we have for you at the moment so you can go and experience that and, and see how you go and if you don't like it you can come back to Stoke go back to training with the reserves playing once a fortnight or once every three weeks because they didn't have as many games as what the first team did. So I went uh, in the end and I loved it and it was great. And it was such a, a contrast from going to Stoke in the week on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, seeing Lamborghinis, Rolls Royce, Bentleys parked up. I mean, Marco Arnautovic had a different car for every day of the week, parked in the car park out front. <laughs> You know, having the gym, having the beautiful surface to play on, all these facilities, and then at the end of the week, going down to Macclesfield, driving an hour up the road, playing there, and lads getting out of Ford Fiestas, but only getting paid maybe a couple of hundred pounds a week. But great guys, good players, and great to get along with. And I loved it, and I loved it so much. By the end of my of my stay, um, in England, I was spending more time at Macclesfield and spending the majority of the week there and maybe only going to Stoke once a week um, because I, I enjoyed it so much and I was playing regularly and I think that was the most important thing. I was enjoying my football at that point as well. Mm-hmm. So how was playing in the conference? Was it, well, I'm, we're not sure, sort of, it's hard for Australians to think of that level because we, you know, we compare a lot of, you know, a lot of people say um, that the NPL is nowhere near comparable to, you know, anywhere below the conference or so like how was that level that you found it um tough I mean I remember when I first got there the manager John Askey kind of looked at me and pulled me to one side and I wasn't playing for the first month and I was getting a bit frustrated because I was thinking to myself you know I'm you know Alex Grant I've come from Stoke City I should be playing every week I'm good enough to play every week and he pulled me to one side and he kind of told me straight and said I look at you and you look like a kid and I said Okay, I said. He said, "Because I, I need am. a man." <laughs> yeah, but he said, "I need, I need men. I need men to play for me." And you've been playing reserve team football for nothing. 
you know, no points on the line, anything like that. So I need you to show me that you want it. You want it more in training and all this and that. He said, you'll get your opportunities just whether you want to take it or not. And I remember playing in the first round of the FA Cup and I scored on my debut um, away at Wrexham. Um, and then from then on, I think I played 28 games for the remainder of the season. So I showed him. <laughs> but, you know, it, it was definitely, definitely an eye-opener. But I think some people, like in Australia, people probably don't give it as much credit as what it's probably worth. I think one thing that they've got in the conference, it's similar to, I probably only compare it to the MPL in Victoria where I know they have two divisions. And I know that the second division, there are teams in that division who pay more money than they do in the first division. And money generally attracts the better players. So that's what I found in the conference, that there were some players there on maybe £2,000 a week, you know, one £2,000 a week, which is very good money over there for a footballer in the lower leagues, playing in the conference, um, only training twice a week. The majority of teams played full-time um, and trained every day, but um, some of these clubs weren't, and they were paying paying the players um, more money than probably what players were getting paid in League 2 and League 1. So you had better quality players dropping down into the conference, which made the standard better, um, I found anyway. That's really, that's really awesome. That's like the dream, really, getting paid more to do less. Um, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, anyway, um, before we continue our chat with Alex, um, we're going to head to our ads from Streamgate and Arrow Sports. So uh, please support our sponsors, guys. When the ad plays, sorry. <laughs> Streamgate is one of Australia's first live streaming companies operating since 2008. They focus on virtual and hybrid events broadcasting to unlimited online audiences worldwide by either a secure private stream or publicly on social media. Live streaming allows social online engagement as viewers are able to communicate back to the presenters in real time while social distancing. So should you require a small personal event or business level webcast, please go to streamgate.com.au or find them on Instagram. With the regular football season in full swing, it is never too early to be thinking about the five-a-side or futsal season. And if you ever wanted to play in your own custom-made jersey, then Arrow Sport is the company for you. Have your own design that you want to use? You can have it on your own jersey that will last for the years to come. Simply message their Sydney-based team and they will do what it takes to make your dreams a reality. Even if you don't have your own design, the team have plenty of templates and designs you can use to inspire your creation. Sashes, stripes, hoops and everything in between. Arrow Sport will help you with everything you need. You can even have your jersey with matching shorts and socks too. Arrow Sport are happy to announce that they have a new deal to celebrate its one year anniversary with custom made football jerseys including free name and number starting from only $50. Create your own history with Arrow Sport and contact them at arrowsport.com.au or their socials at arrowsportau or one word to get your design started. Thank you, Arrow Sport and Streamgate Live Streaming Australia. Thank you, Joe. Now, Alex, one thing um, I found particularly funny, when you first signed for the glory, I was a big FIFA player at the time, right? Okay. Um, and your ultimate team card, so you originally Stoke, you were a 52-rated centre-back, right? Um, and when you came to the glory, it said you were 5'11", right, in height. I remember the first game you played for the glory, I said, this guy is huge. He's not 5'11". 5'11 <laughs> wide. Point... I was 5'11 <laughs> wide at the time. That was it. <laughs> I remember I find that really funny because I think you were just – I remember you being the biggest player on the park when you were the glory. and you, So you first came in, one of the bigger, biggest boys, and I just thought that was that was hilarious. But <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've had a few people message me. I think – I don't know where it is where that's been put up. I think initially maybe it was the glory who put it up on their website – and a couple of other websites have gone on to that and, and brought it onto theirs because I've had agents message me saying, you know, you're a centre-back, how tall are you? It says, here hey, you're 5'11 five, five or whatever. And I'm like, no, I'm like 6'3. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, yeah. I remember, I remember I asked Dad when he – um I asked Dad when he yeah, – I said, how, how long is Alex – how tall is Alex suit? Because he, he can't be he can't be like my my size. He goes, no, he's, he's pretty, it's a long suit. <laughs> But yeah. Um, now, going into one of our, we'll go into one of our reader questions. 
Uh, Chicken Treat Fan Club. He says, hey, mate, what's your go-to order from Chicken Treat? You know what? I I lived in uh, Doubleview and we had a Chicken Treat in, um, where was it? Wembley Downs. don't know if you've been to it. Um, I think I've got a mate who's in Doubleview, so I think I know the one. Off Weapon S it is. Off Weapon S on the corner. I think he's been held up a couple of times actually in recent recent times but that's probably why i've not been in there but no, I, I'm, I'm, i'll be honest with you i've got to let grouse grant down here because i'm not a um i don't usually uh talk into a a chicken treat too often i know my my missus though she's or in the past anyway she did she used to have the um chicken che- chicken cheese is it i don't know Chicken cheese, I don't know. That's what she told me anyway. Because I asked her, because I was looking at Twitter last night and I seen a few of the questions that I got tagged in and that being one of it. And it was just funny that at the time, because um, I've streamed some of the Aussie channels over here on the on the box and uh, a, a, an advert came up for Chicken Treat and it was a palm, a palmy burger. And I thought, whoa, mm. I'd love one of them. That'd be decent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one looked good. So if I was to come back oh, to no. Perth, then maybe I will get a palmy burger from Chicken Tree. <laughs> sure, love that. Um, we've got Francis asks, and I think leading on a bit into your into sort of early years of Perth Glory, about your most memorable Perth Glory game. Um, most you memorable Perth Glory. I probably got a few. To be fair, I remember, especially my first season, we went on a great run towards the end, and. I think it was a final home game against Melbourne City and we absolutely bopped them, played them off the park and I think we there was 16,000 there. That was my first taste of a, a massive crowd at HBF um, when it was... Is it HBF now? What is it? It was Nib yeah. at the time. Yeah, HBF, HBF Nib at yeah. the time, yeah. Um, and it was pumping. The shed was, was going all guns blazing um, and, and that was definitely a memorable game. And another... Melbourne City game um, the following season early on uh, there's a funny photo I don't know if you you could have a look um, of Andy Keogh giving a little glance over his shoulder um, after scoring a I think it was an 85th minute winner um, I can, I can remember Park this in a 3-2 win uh, and I just I can just see that little glance now, and I was just think, oh, we're going to be having a few beers after the game, and that was kind of the that was the glance like, how, how many beers are we having tonight, boys, kind of thing, you know? It was uh, that was definitely a, a remember one, and I think as well also another game was probably another three two win. So there you go, three three two wins with um, at the start of um, Popper's tenure. Tenure is that the right word? Is that the right yeah, word? Tenure. Yeah, 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 yeah. tenure. Yeah, that's um, the one. Yeah, okay, just checking. Um, and we beat Victory 3-2 away from half. I think we were 2-0 up at half time, and they pulled two back. And uh, Chris Economides scored a late winner. And that, I think that was the the game. That was early on in the uh, season. It was. It was early on. I think it was maybe the second or third round. And we'd lost someone to injury as well the week before. And I think everyone was kind of a bit like shitting it, thinking, oh, God, gone a victory. I don't know whether we're going to get get the points. And that was the first time I think I thought we could definitely do. Even that early in the season, I thought this is this is going to be the season where you know we're going to do a bit and we're going to pick up something at the end of it. I remember the first game of that season it was against Brisbane at home, and I was just no, shocked. West, was like, Western Sydney it was West, Western Sydney. Your game or the game I'm thinking of? Oh, your the following season was Brisbane, but well, the first season when we won the Premier's plate was Western Sydney. I might, it could have been a home. Oh, what, what, anyway, it was definitely home. Brisbane. Definitely home. Yeah, and I remember like I was just shocked as to like how you guys played. It was like, what the fuck has Popper done in like eight weeks? It was like a yeah. totally different team. And like, I remember like Jason Davidson back. just had the whole of the left field like free for like the entire game. And I was going, this season something's going to happen to us. And yeah, it was sure. just insane. That's it. And and just going back to that, like looking at the squad on paper. I think that year, especially the players that he brought in, um, definitely had an impact. And there was competition for spots all over the park. And because um, I, I watch all the Glory games whilst whilst I'm over, I still still follow the team because obviously I've got a mate, a lot of mates within the squad, and and probably that's not been there this year. Um, we've not had much competition for places, so 
Uh, although the team has chopped and changed quite a fair bit over the course of the season. But I think that was one thing we had depth within in the squad. Like we had up front, we had like um, Santa and then we had uh, Andy and we had Joel, Chris Konamidis, Fabio Ferreira, who I tell you, brought didn't, me Didn't on. even get a game. Didn't get a game, but I tell you what, Fab, what a guy, great guy. And in training, to say he wasn't playing, always kept his spirit. So you can always have a laugh with him. And what a player, so sharp, um, made me a better player anyway. And like I said, I give Joel credit as well because I think Joel's probably been one of the most underrated players um, in the A-League. I know Neil Kilkenny's come out and said that a few times as well, but I, I definitely agree that Joel, I don't know what you guys think about Joel, but oh. he's he's definitely been a great player. I feel you can tell, like, the, the for, for Joel, you can tell like the improvement. Because like, when we first had him, I think under Kenny, he was like, oh, one of those I... Like, like recycled like A League players, and then under Popper, it was like a totally different player. And even now, he's like scoring goals from outside the box, like a very versatile yeah. as well. Like can play and it works really hard. I think wherever he plays, and like he's a good defender, even though he can defend from the front as well. I think which yeah. is something that's really important. Um, yeah, we're big fans of big fans of Joel. Yeah. Um, but Alex, when you first came to the Glory, the first year that 2015, yeah, yeah, 2015 16 season it was. Yeah. Yeah. So, was this the year after or before the salary cap breach? So it, it was funny. So I had just been released by Stoke, and I remember going into a meeting with the the technical director, and my agent went in, and uh, he came out and said, "Oh, they're not keeping you on," and it wasn't a shock to me. I think it was more of a shock to him. Um, because I, I'd done well out on loan, but I, I knew where I was. I knew, I knew at that time I was not good enough to progress um, at Stoke, and it was definitely, um, you know, realization there that that probably wasn't I wasn't going to reach that height at that particular time. Um, but I had goals to to still kick on, and I remember returning to Australia, and I spoke to my agent in the UK, and he'd lined up a couple of trials. Um, at lower league clubs back in the UK, and I can't remember what teams off the top of my head. So nothing, nothing really solid. So there was kind of that fear once again that, oh geez, if I go back, I've got to impress someone, and which I, I was confident I could do, but I just didn't know whether I wanted to do that and mm. you know go through that process when I played yeah, out yeah. on loan. I, I got games under my belt. You know, I played forty odd games or whatever. I was 20, 20 or twenty one. I think it was twenty. And um, yeah, I just I just kind of felt, oh look, I'll put it on the back burner and see how we go. And, and then whilst I was at home, I got a phone call from Kenny. Because Kenny had been my NTC coach when I was a kid, so we we knew each other well. We had a good relationship when when I was younger. And he basically said, yeah, look, we'll we'll go for a coffee. We'll have a chat and. I on the phone just expected, you know, I'll just have a chat with Kenny and and uh, see where it goes, you know, and didn't expect too much. Uh, I knew obviously all the salary cap um, saga had just happened and the club was going through a bit of turmoil and whatnot with all that and the, their season getting canned. And we met at Greens in Leederville and uh, we had a <laughs> coffee and, and within uh, probably 10 minutes he'd offer me a contract and I was like, oh. Right, well, that was pretty easy, wasn't it? So uh, they must be paid for the must, coffee. They, that's it. They, uh, I can't remember. I think Kenny got it. There you go. He's a he's a good, great it's a guy. Win win. Anyway, it was a win win. So uh, yeah, it was, uh, that's kind of how it all started. And, and then I went back to the UK because um, my girlfriend at the time she was back there. So I went back. I said to her, "Look, I've been offered a deal at Glory at home. I think it'd be good. You know, going back there. It's kind of a side step, and then there's kind of avenues to go into Asia and kick on from there." So I went and uh, Cheeky followed followed me um, as well, and you know that didn't last too long. Um, she was straight back again, um, but yeah, I had some great years, great years at Chloe. I loved it. I'm just talking about the UK as well. Gunwin asks us, "Is it true back home they call you the Manchester Maldini?" He knows it's true. He's a yeah, an old family friend, Jack. I'll give him a shout out. I don't know if you're listening. <laughs> He's uh, he was actually living in Sydney uh, for a couple of years, um, and I went to see him. He came to I think he came to one of the games whilst I was playing over there. But yeah, we go back a long way. Uh, Dean Sports FC was m- my first ever club when I was probably eight years old um, in Manchester, uh, the same club where Ryan Giggs was found. 
um, by a scout called Dennis Schofield who picked him up and took him to Man City. I don't know if you've heard the story. And he was a milkman doing a doing his rounds around Manchester, and he saw him and had him playing for Deans, and then took him to Man City. And then the scout said Man United plucked him away because he was a new new they knew he was a big Man United fan, and you know the rest is history. So. Were you trying to impress all the milkmen after after you heard that story? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Always keep an eye out, eh? <laughs> <laughs> A few jugglers at the front of the house. That's it. All right. Um, so uh, talk a little bit under the – because you touched on under Kenny. Like you played a lot of games, I remember. You were beating, Mel- were beating Melbourne City away from home. Or be- we were beating Melbourne City under Kenny Lowe, I think, far more times than like, we lost. And like I know a lot of the uh, the years that you were there under Kenny, like we made the finals. I think uh, mostly every year, I think, but made that run towards the end of the season. But started seasons quite slow. Um, how is that sort of? I know, like I don't remember those years. Fans was frustrated starting the season slow, but really like pushed on to the end of the season really good. People were saying like, oh, the squad wasn't fit enough. Like I know injuries were pretty were bad at the start of the year and were only fit towards the end. Like, do you think you know if you were like could you could you have been fitter at those start of the season and you could have had like a, the squad could have had a better year um the whole year in those early years of glory um i think look i always compare it to to when popo was popo was there because he obviously mm. brought the success of the club and and kenny was also a great manager and um i really enjoyed playing on the kenny and we did we played some really great football um but um the managing of the group was was different and Kenny had a different approach as some managers do you know not every what not every manager is the same and they're always going to approach their job differently and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't and in Kenny's case um it worked in spells and I think we were kind of let off the leash a little and um, there wasn't that um discipline I'd say um it was kind of left within the group to, to police things and the, the senior players were kind of given the control and the power to do that um, and you know me, me and Kenny had a great relationship and um, his training sessions were good they were fun um, you know I, I, I think the, if you looked at the way we played we were definitely more attacking minded and like you said it, it was as though we were kind of outscoring teams and you had Liam Reddy getting frustrated at the other end because even though we were winning, we were still leaking maybe three or four goals a game. Yeah. And and you can't you can't do that and get success. If you look at all the teams who've won the A League over the last whatever it is, fifteen years, the majority of the teams who've won it, the the goals conceded has been less than the games they've played. And I think we caught like 50 goals or probably on average, I don't know what it is, but probably around 40 for the three years that Kenny was there whilst I was playing. So that was probably where we struggled defensively. I think we we just weren't a tight ship. Um, And, you know, that's probably why we only scraped into the finals. And I know the last year that Kenny was there, we didn't even make them. So, yeah. yeah. Last year, yeah. I'm touching on a different type of finals now. Uh, the Euro Championships start this week, Alex, and yourself being a huge England fan, are you, were, were you born there? I was, yeah. I was born in Manchester. Yeah. Yes. So what are your expectations for England this Euros? Um, well, we've not touched on it, lads, but I've got to plug my own pod because we have... Oh, we, go on, yeah, go the, on, Alex. Yeah, there on. we go. The Shooting Zars podcast with myself, Stuart Marshall, Bryce Conway. We'll give you boys a shout out as well. When I think we're recording tomorrow, actually. Oh, so um, I'll have to tell our followers to give you boys a listen as well. But yeah, we're we're recording a few few pods over the uh, the course of the the tournament, so that'll be fun. But I think going back to it, I hope England can win it. We always. Is it uh, oh God, I hope so. I really do. <laughs> but just as an England fan, like I, I've loved England my whole life. I've always supported them. Um, since I moved to Australia, obviously I've got separated away from it a bit and I love watching the Socceroos as well and, and follow them and support them whenever they're in major tournaments and whatnot. But yeah, England, like I said, is where I was born and I've always got great memories from back there and every major tournament they let us down. But 
I think Gareth's just got such a good squad at hand and so much competition, um, especially in the attacking positions. And they're just an exciting team to watch, I find. And you saw it in the World Cup. And even that squad was probably a lot different to the one they've got now, but he just seems to have them regimented and doing the right things and free flowing football. And, you know, I think they, I, I hope they can go all the way. They've definitely got the squad on paper to do that, but there's, you know, all the teams in there who are, are also good on paper. So we'll have to see. Oh, as long as the Italians don't win it, eh? <laughs> hey, Alex, the squad's looking good. The, the Italian squad's looking good. Is it? Does your, does your dad, is your dad going for Italy then? Yeah, yeah, he's he's uh, he's he's been watching a few of the he watched through the qualifiers, so he's getting into it. Is it? God, I've had some yeah. great combos with your dad. <laughs> I tell you, the guy, I want a guy as well. Oh, he can talk for days, can't he? So I tell you, I'll get in my suit sometimes, and I'll be looking at my watch thinking, oh, Tony, I've got to go. <laughs> <laughs> I miss training. <laughs> uh, Kenny, oh, Kenny God. would understand. Kenny would, he would understand if you nah, miss training. Oh, that's funny. Now, guys, that's if you want to support the podcast, Trent, how can they do that? Uh, they can go to patreon.com forward slash soccer podcast. And, and what can uh, they get? For as little get, as two US dollars a month, you can two US receive. Dollars. What can they uh, receive? Exclusive Discord access, Joe. Yeah. Uh, shout outs at the end of the show um, and uh, exclusive content when me and Joe can uh, produce it. <laughs> Now, Alex, um, we asked you to read out some names before. Um, fire away. Okay, here we got Edward Watson, Adrian Benoza, Ben Miro, Neil Simmons, Ryan Robinson, Andy Tin, John Morris, Harry Russell, Harry, uh, Dennis Fernandez. Oh, I like that one. Dennis Fernandez, eh? Like Bruno. Get in. Uh, ben Robson. Natasha Williams, Andrea, um, David Clark, Fraser Marnham, and Glenn Oliveira. Thank you so much, guys, for supporting the show. We honestly can't keep up the or keep on the lights without you guys. We can't, we can't. Now, um, Joe, uh, Ale- just quickly, Alex pronounced Glenn Oliveira's name better than you did, Joe, for about six months of the podcast. It, it only so. took me about twenty episodes. <laughs> well, how did you say it? Glenn Oliveira. Yeah, like the O-Oliviero. E, I, E, R. Yeah. yeah. But it's all of it. Portuguese, so. but I was Oliveira. Wrong. Oliveira. Um, now, the A-League finals are coming up as well, Alex. You have you said you've been watching the A-League. Um, who's your tip to take home the, uh, is it the plate? or Yeah, no, the, the ring one. The toilet seat. The toilet, toilet seat. Yeah, the, the plate's gone. The to- yeah, the toilet yeah, the seat's the one that's up. Uh, Melbourne City. They're going to win it. Even without like Jamie McLaren, Curtis Good, and I mean, is the goalkeeper out as well? Mecca. <sighs> I know, I know they are they are out of it, and that probably does throw a little bit of a spanner in the works. But I know with Jamie not being there, um, that's definitely going to put a dent in their chances. But I think I'm just going to say them anyway because I've, from what I've watched over the course of the season, they have been by far the best team in the league um, by a mile. They're saucy. They are. They're they a are good team. Good. They play good football. Very saucy. Very saucy. All right, Joe, do you have any uh, closing comments for Alex? Um, I've, I can get another fun fact. Please, Joe, oh, please. Oh. <laughs> um, let's. <clears throat> um, about 63% of South Korea is covered in forest. Yeah. Alex, have you been to the forest? Yeah. Have you, no, have you been... got, to be fair, it's it's gone down now, but out the back of the apartment, there's just loads of it. Yeah. Have you gone sightseeing yeah. in uh, Korea? Um, sightseeing? No, not really. No, we'd we've not been. Where have we been? We've been to Busan, Daegu. Um, Busan's like a big city. It's probably about an hour and a half drive from here. But we we stayed we stayed there last weekend. Actually, it's quite nice along the beach. And it's called Hyundai Beach. Um, you know, get an ice cream, have a wander, have a stroll. Uh, beautiful. But uh, yeah, there's a an island off the south coast that south west coast called jeju which i won't mind going to at some point because well, i've actually got one. a fun fact about uh, the islands a bit around uh, korea yeah go um, on find go it on. um yeah. there are more than three thousand islands around south korea with jeju being the biggest yeah i think it's pretty big yeah they've got a football team there and i think we've oh we played them away i think already this season we, so i might have missed that one 
but I'll have to go on holiday. Take the little one. <laughs> anyway, Trent, were there any last comments you wanted to add? Uh, there's not, but Alex, we wish you the best of luck getting over your injury, getting back into the squad, getting back into football. Um, best of luck with your podcast. Thank you. Uh, and Where can uh, they find thanks. it, Alex? Uh, oh, yeah. Jeez. It just shows you that Stewie's the one who's the one who does the, uh, the plug-in. Because we're, I think we're on uh, – see, I don't even know where we're on. I think we're on Spotify, SoundCloud. Um, I listened on Spotify, so you're on Spotify. Yeah, okay. And, and Apple as well. Or iTunes, whatever it is, the podcast one. And that's Shooting Zars. Shooting Zars, yeah. Shooting Zars. How do they spell it? T-S-A-R-S. There you go. Let's give that a listen. And while you're at it, I don't know, say hi to Alex and the crew there. Um, but anyway, guys, thank you so much for listening for 51 minutes. That's way too long. Um, <laughs> but anyway, guys, if you enjoyed it, make sure to subscribe, like the comment, um, follow Alex on his socials and go the Pohang Steelers. Fighting. Good evening. See ya.